Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very, very important event for the archives and for St. Lucia. When we reached out to the steel ban, if you wish, community, everybody was so welcoming, first at the idea, and secondly, so willing in terms of assisting the National Archives in putting steel ban on the map. I think it is safe to say that every minute of every day, someone somewhere in the world is playing, is listening to, reading about, learning to play pan, etc. This just tells us how magnificent an instrument the steel ban is, and I'm sure um, the director of the National Archives Authority will run down on the history of the steel ban. But considering where the steel ban started, we have seen that it has grown tremendously to become a worldwide recognized instrument. But it's also been an instrument that has saved so many lives. We were hoping today to have a testimony from one of the persons who served as the, uh, or who played first in the Catholic Church in St. Lucia. I haven't seen him, but I'm hoping that he will be here to let you know. One of the pan men who first played in the Catholic Church steel band in St. Lucia. Well, as I said, I'm not going to make um, a long welcome remarks to you, but I just want to say we're very happy that all of you could come despite the weather, and I hope that you will have a good time, especially when you see the display that we have for you um, this morning. At this time, I will ask for those making donation of manuscripts to please come forward and call on Mrs. Margot Thomas to supervise and receive these manuscripts. On behalf of the National Archives, I am very pleased to accept from Ms. Anne Dawn French two books from her Peanut Tales entitled Peanut and the Caribbean Myths. It is a storybook and coloring book for children. Ms. French is a very prolific writer. I think she has over 500 books to her name. And she ensures that she passes on these publications to us so we could preserve them for posterity. Other individuals said that they would be here to give us publications and manuscripts, but they're not here as yet. However, I would like them to know that Whenever they're ready to give us manuscripts, we're always ready to accept them. Let us give Ms. Dawn French a round of applause. I would like to call now on the representative of the Open University, Ms. Daisy St. Rose, to come forward to receive the Roderick Walcott Memory of the World Certificate. Very briefly, I just want to explain something about the Memory of the World. The Memory of the World deals with trying to preserve for posterity collections which are of utmost importance to the country where the writer produced those works. So we have three registers, an international register, a regional register, and a local or national register. To date, Sir Arthur Lewis's collection is on the international register and by extension on the regional and the local. Sir Derek Walcott's work is also on the international register. Roderick Walcott's work is on the regional register for Latin America and the Caribbean. 
His, the majority of his work is housed at the Open University, so the certificate is given to the Open University where it will be displayed, I am sure, so everybody could see Roddy did work not only for himself, but for the whole of Latin America and the Caribbean and the world. Miss Daisy St. Rose. So you could see a beautiful certificate, well framed, so she doesn't have any work to do. <laughs> Open campus. One correction, she wants me to know that it is the University of the West Indies Open Campus. Okay? Then we have another one, and it is work that we did pertaining to those people who left the Caribbean, St. Lucia in particular, and went to work on the Panama Canal. So you find that it is a joint effort between the archives of Panama and St. Lucia. And the certificate for the memory of the world is to be housed in our National Archives Authority of St. Lucia. So I will call on Ms. Juliana Alfred, one of our board members, and she will accept it for our archives. The full title is The Silver Men, West Indian Laborers at the Panama Canal. Ms. Alfred, thank you this is for our archives. Thank you so much. At this time, we sing the National Archives Anthem. And this will be done by the National Archives staff. The words are on the back of your program.
this time we have some remarks. And let me just say that we reached out to the St. Lucia Steel Bands Association and we got such a rousing um, interest in what we were doing. This is not the first time that it's, uh, there's been a try to write the history of steel band in St. Lucia. Many persons have taken the plunge and the Archives Authority is doing this, not because it's a research organization, but it facilitates the research. The collections are full of stories of the first start of steel band in St. Lucia. Up to the present day, um, the number of steel bands that are popping up, at, as particularly at secondary schools in St. Lucia. I was at the St. Joseph's Convent um, last week and the arranger, as well as band leader, Mr. Ivan Smith, proudly told me that St. Lucia has more women plan players than men. And, yes or no? No? And that is on account of the fact that almost every year, the St. Joseph's Convent graduates um, a steel band. And um, Ivan has been with the St. Joseph's Convent for 21 years. So, and that's why we're here. Maybe some people may want to dispute it and come up with the correct figure because the, um, <laughs> the archives wants to get the record straight. Yeah. All right? At this time, let me call a representative of the Steel Bands Association, Mr. Minel Lovens, to offer some greetings and remarks. Okay. Um, the St. Lucia National Steel Bands Association is happy to be part of this occasion. In 2005, eight bands signed onto the constitution of the association, and mostly these bands were from the north of the island. Okay. And now, today, the association has seen the emergence of steel bands throughout the length and breadth of the island at both community levels and school levels because we believe that um, we need to push the youth forward to keep the art form itself going, okay? We are grateful to pioneers such as Leonard Scrub Wellington and Gregory Shining Emmanuel, who is present with us today, okay? <laughs> who have helped to shape the pan fraternity within St. Lucia. We also express gratitude to those who have come on after and carried on the legacy, people like Cecil Filgens, Alison Markey, Veronica Augustine, Quill Barthelme, Lan Shepard, Lucius Alexander, Guy Innocent, and also the only female band leader and arranger on Ireland right now, Crystal Nestor, who is a graduate of the program at St. Joseph's Convent, which is run by Mr. Smith. Um, the association wishes to express its gratitude to the National Archives for the work done and look forward to the future. In the words of the mighty shadow, music fills the world with happiness, plenty sweetness, and togetherness. Everybody play pan. Thank you so much. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Next to bring remarks is Mr. Monty Maxwell, and he'll focus on steel band in the south of St. Lucia. My name is Monty Maxwell. I am a Beaufort son, and um, if I have to go into pan in view for that will take a little time. So I'll try and do it as, as quickly as I can. Um, pan really, the amazing thing, St. Lucia on the whole, Pan in its infancy was in St. Lucia because according to the reports that um, because of the abundance of oil drums, discarded oil drums, the presence of the American forces, the 59 bomber squadron of the US Navy was deployed from the Panama Canal into the Caribbean, Trinidad, Beanfield, Beaufort, Coolidge, Antigua, etc., etc. And um, it is said that Pan came out of you know, the discarded air, um, drums and so on, oil drums. And in the 40s, Pan was in St. Lucia. And this may have been because people like Scrub and our shine from Beaufort, George Thomas, 
who was a relative of Sir Lytton Thomas. Um, maybe that accounts to the presence of Pan in, in, in Beaufort so early. So uh, I don't know too much about these guys. I heard the reports, but I have a colleague of mine, a fellow of Euphorsian, whom I think you know, Mr. Eldridge Stevens. He wrote a very comprehensive article. He was just telling me, which is available, and he was just telling me he had to travel to London to get the information from one of the guys who was involved with the early steel pans in Beaufort. I'm talking about the late 40s, 50s, etc. Um, I came in a little after, and I will give you an insight into what happened from the late 60s till now. Um, I went to Beaufort Secondary School, and we were very fortunate. Now, I should tell you first that um, I, I am a Hmong boy. I was, I was born in the Hmong in Beaufort. And those of you who don't know where this area is, this is a place that, this was the capital of Beaufort, the center of everything, sports. And Mr. Stevens can tell you, if he needed a good football or cricket match, he had to come from the Labouchoui and come into the Hmong for this. <laughs> We've nurtured musicians, academics, um, artists, uh, all kinds of people. Um, Bradley, um, Pascal, who was the, the opera singer. Blaise, his name is actually Pascal. Bradley Pascal. Um, but he gave his professional name, Blaise, etc. Um, you know, all these people are from, from these areas. And, and what was the Mang really? It was a place where the people of Pointe Sab were transferred from Pointe Sab, where the hotel is, to an area which was backfilled from Clark Street going up to the beach because of the Americans, they needed the nice spaces for them to live and build their houses. So it's really a, it was not a ghetto. I didn't know the word ghetto at all growing up. But fortunately, folks, my mother went to the UK, and she's still there. And I was thrust into the, the adobe, so to speak, of my grandmother, who was first generation Indian from India. And um, next door was a fella called George Shine Thomas, who was keeping noise all day long, making pans, beating pans, practicing. And this was really annoying to me, because I was a kind of academic fellow who wanted to study and so on. And um, I went to Viewfort Secondary School. And lo and behold, there's a program, classical music. And the principal at the time was a gentleman called Dio Ramnarine, an Indian gentleman from Trinidad, and he loved Pan. So he made a deal or some kind of arrangement with Halcyon, which was being built at the time, that's Court Line from England, and they funded Pans from Trinidad. So a whole set of Pans came in at Beaufort Secondary School, and um, a gentleman who used to be a tenor Pan player of Texaco Dixieland called John Joseph, he got a contract to teach us together with an English lady called Mrs. Miss Hyatt. So we had a classical music program with steel pan as the main instrument. So we were very, very lucky. We, we, we didn't realize that at the time. So um, Mr. Joseph nurtured us. He wasn't a fantastic musician, but he did his job. And we had one big advantage. We had the ringing pans. Shining can tell you. At the time, <laughs> Pans in St. Lucia didn't used to ring. You know, we have this nice ringing harmonic at the end of the note. So we had this big advantage. And we went to Panorama, 1971, I think. And the test tune was Timamai. And you had to do another calypso. We did Rope by Sparrow. And we won. We won Diamond Steel and North Stars and so on. And thank God, we traveled on success. Where you have this... These, these galvanized windows, bottle and stone <laughs> in Masha. So we had to get out of Masha very, very quickly. <laughs> but, but I should tell you that um, Shine next door nurtured a lot of these young fellas who used to play marbles in the pan yard and so on. And um, when I went to Viewport Secondary School and I enrolled in the, the music program, everything they were teaching I knew. It was very easy for me and I wondered why years after and it came to me, you know, I heard the arpeggios, ba -da -ba, ping, ping, ping. I heard the major scales, I didn't know what they were. But when I entered the music program, I knew what these things were. 
because I heard it every day next door. And I realized Shine was a big influence in our lives, most of the young fellas. So what I did subsequently before his passing, I composed a piece for him that I call Shine. And I got, this, I got Mr. Alison Markey to me, is one of the greatest panists in the world. I'm saying this, you know why? You know, you know why I'm saying this? Because Pan is from the Caribbean. So if you have a man who's one of the best panists in the Caribbean, he's one of the best panists in the world. You agree with that? Yeah, man. So tell me what Andy Narell can play and, and Alison can play. You know? But anyway. Um, I did this album and I had Alison Markey to feature as the panist on this and I did it in a big studio in New Jersey. It's on Amazon. I'm not marketing it. I do have some copies available, etc. <laughs> and I have presented one to the archives. Um, subsequently, well, after, after we left high school, um, secondary school, uh, most of the guys who did the classic pro music program left. They migrated. So we had to choose fellas from the town. And most of these fellas who grew up around Shine were interested, obviously, for obvious reasons. So we brought in several of these guys from town. And Halcyon contracted me as the arranger. So I taught all these guys who were some of them older than me. And Mr. Sims, I do some of them, Charlo and Agarlo and all these fellas. And, and, and some of them are still working as musicians and um, that w you know that went on for a little while and I decided to I, I nurtured a young fella called Mr. Arthur Theodore known as Baba Baba was sent to Trinidad to do a course in steel pan, steel pan making and etc uh, and, and etc cetera, et cetera. and he came back with a lot of skills and up to this day he's making pans in Beaufort for anybody who wants a good pan and so on. Is Ivan there, no? Anyway, um, so I, I, I taught Baba how to arrange and I moved on because I was involved in survival and bands and so on. And um, after that, uh, 1991, I got a call from Hanko. Hanko said, look, um, Monty, we're organizing a steel band and we need an arranger. We had a recommendation that you are an arranger. I said, boy, I did this 10 years ago, you know. Ivan Smith recommended me as the arranger because he was doing work with them. So I went, about 30, 40 people, taught them, nurtured them. And then in 1998, I think, they said, look, we're going to Panorama. I said, you're all madman. You all just start playing Silban five years. You want to go and compete against Shining and Ivan and Alison Marquis and Allegro. I said, you all are mad. How, how do we do that? So um, they convinced me. So I had, to do very, very, I had to be very, very strategic, arranging something sweet, not too complicated. And you know what, folks? Two years in a row, we play second against these giants. That was an achievement, you oh, know? Yes. And <laughs> thank you very much. The first piece I composed, I call it Melody for JJ, Melody for John Joseph the guy from Trinidad who taught us how to play. And the other piece, the following year, I composed it and arranged it and I call it Mangrove, a groove for the man. Yeah, man. And um, I, I am, you know, uh, I talk about that and I get so emotional and so on. But anyway, um, Hanko, Persisted, I give them a, rep, a, rep, a good repertoire for the hotels, and they're still playing up to now at Anshasne, do a lot of jazz things and so on. So, uh, I need to mention quickly also what has happened in the other communities. In Labri, the Stilban has been there a very, very long time. Stilban has been in Labri for a long time. There was a gentleman called Defe. Defe was a, a fisherman who worked also as a security guard in Halcyon Days. That's why I met him. And um, he passed on the baton. He eventually passed on. And Spencer Emmanuel, Spencer Emmanuel nurtured a group of, of um, young people, including Quill Bafelmi, who's holding the mantle right now. So Stilpan, Stilpan has been in library for a very long time. 
In Sufre, there is a group called Sulfur Stars, I think. I don't know too much about what has happened in Sufre with regards to steel pan. In Miku, I know the church got some pans, and they call them what, St. Lucy's? And this was um, pioneered by Mrs. Augustine and Mrs. Sadu from the church. And I have actually had talks with them. They wanted me to do some work arranging, but I think Zorro is doing that now with them. Because, you know, we were all tied up and so on. So um, there, there has been a presence of steel band in the south of the island as, as long as you've had it in castries. And um, the, the, the principal people involved in, in, in um, steel pan in Viewfort was Mr. Thomas and his colleagues. And, and you know, I want to, Mr. Stevens has written it in his article, Ivan, I see Ivan coming in. And um, that was brother to Mr. Lytton Thomas. And these guys were going to, going to Castries to do a gig, I think. And the pans were shifting at the back of the vehicle. So he climbed at the back of the bus to arrange the tap, to, to fix the tarpaulin and so on. And unfortunately, he was knocked over by a tree branch and he met his demise. And, and folks, that is significant. This is, a, this is a guy who loves steel pan and he died, you know, in steel pan. So um, we've had this presence in Beaufort for a very long time. And um, uh, one more thing I need to tell you that Mr. Shine was so influential in the man that um, a road was built connecting Clark Street with New Dock Road next to Bravo, if you know Viewfort. And um, the prime minister at the time, who taught me at school, and he knows that I play pan, said to me, look, Monty, we need to name that road. I said, sir, I have a name for the road, you know. He said, what name? So I had to give him a whole briefing about Shine. And right now, this road is called the George Shine Thomas Road, connecting, I'm um, drive, sorry, connecting New Dock Road into Viewfort. So I'm very happy that, that we recognize him for all the work that he did, et cetera. And I, I can go on with steel pan stories for the whole day, but I see the stage police is here. So folks, thank you very much for listening to my diet. Okay. And, I hope I have enlightened you a little bit. <laughs> Thank you very much, Monty. Could you imagine if we gathered all these wonderful stories about steel band in St. Lucia, we have a winner on our hands, I can assure you. Because as I said before, going around, talking to different you know, persons involved with the pan movement in St. Lucia, there are a lot of stories that needed to be recorded right now. And just before I call Margot to the microphone, because the gentleman isn't here, I just want to, to tell his story very briefly. I was talking, as I usually do, to all sorts of people, and he was saying, you know, I was one of the fellas that was saved by Pan. And the name of Father John came up. It was Father John who introduced this these, um, group of, of students to the Pan. And... It was because of this they were able to play as the first um, set of young persons to play pan in the Catholic Church. Now, that was years ago. And he did tell me, too, that there were five of them who played at the time. One is dead. No, one person we know, Observer, who recently passed. The other one was Black Eye. And the other two have since passed. And he is alive, and he says to me, you know, if it wasn't for Pan and for Father John, I would not have been where I am today. He's a taxi driver um, organizing tours, and I don't know if that's one of the reasons why he isn't here today. But he was, his intention was to come and share fully his story with you. And so it just goes to show that, you know, uh, how, how impactful Steel Ban is, because you wonder what kind of people take responsibility for, you know, 20 children in a band and have such a great, you know, personal, um, how do I say, connection with them to the point where they can play in unison, you know. We need to sort of look at the personalities, at the environment, at the, the groups, at the, you know, um, different sectors, women in pan, youth in pan, you know, old people in pan, I don't know, every, 
all sorts of um, different sectors in Pan. And uh, we need to sort of support the work, like let's say, of the Steel Bands Association because they are saving lives um, in more ways than one. At this time, with more information, let me call Director of the National Archives Authority of St. Lucia, Mrs. Margot Thomas, to make some remarks. The sweet pulsating sound of the steel pan is distinctly associated with the Caribbean generally, and more specifically with the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Feet can hardly stand still, neither can the waist be stationary when the airs are assailed by the sounds generated by those steel pans, even though you are Christian. <laughs> Today, the steel pan is the national musical instrument of Trinidad and Tobago, and the individuals who were the creative masterminds and innovators in the crafting of the steel pan as a musical instrument are now revered pioneers on whom numerous accolades have been bestowed. The instrument is no longer a crude oil drum or a discarded biscuit tin whose musicality was forged in the broken down fire pits of some slum but rather they are now shiny and chrome-plated factory manufactured musical instruments on par with any other percussion instrument. It was not always so. The creation of the steel pan was not an easy task and it was not the achievement of one individual. However, there was a quartet who pursued the development of the steel pan. Winston Spree Simon created the first melody pan that produced eight notes. And Winston's pan was convex. It wasn't the concave pan that we know today. And, they would, and he would use a piece of a broomstick to beat on it to get his melody. Anthony Williams introduced the unmistakable spider web design and invented the fourth and fifth soprano pans. In addition, he was the first one to use 55 gallon drums for his pans. Bertie Marshall invented the double tenor pan and was the first person to use a canopy over the pans to shield them from the detrimental effects of the sunlight. Ellie Manette was the first person to resurface the pan into its concave shape to accommodate more pitches on the plane surface. He is the one who also wrapped the sticks with the rubber to produce a more refined tone. In fact, he invented seven of the 10 pans that are in use. These were the pioneers. As the steel pan became more popular, it found a home within Carnival, and the two became intertwined as it replaced the taboo bamboo. In those days, they used different lengths of bamboo to produce sound, etc. This did not happen only in Trinidad, but throughout the other Caribbean countries with the ease of inter-island travel then. St. Lucia was no exception, and the steel pan and its music found a home in the island around World War II. Just as in Trinidad, the steel pan's home was the more depressed areas of Castries. So you had the Conway, Fuasho, Marsha, Riverside Road. And remember, in those days, the church regarded the steel pan as an instrument of sin and a vehicle that encouraged illicit sex and violence. Church going good Christians did not get involved with pan. Pioneers in the development of the St. Lucia steel pan story were in individuals such as Augustus Pan Andrew, Leonard Scrub Wellington, Arthur Jakes Jacobs, Gregory Shining Emmanuel, and many others. 
Turks Carnival Band, led by Roderick Walcott, became the hangout place for the more educated boys. And they learned how to play pan and tune pan, etc. I must say also that in 1947, Mr. Belgrave, those of us who, who knew him, a big, big, tall, strapping man, Mr. Belgrave, he had formed the boys club and he was instrumental in helping the boys learn and get trained in tuning and arranging. The steel pan symbolizes for me the Caribbean individual who has had to overcome all kinds of challenges to gain a place on the international stage. The Nobel laureates did not get to the pinnacle by chance, but by dint of hard work, sacrifice, and perseverance. It is coincidental that the steel pan is alleged to have been invented in the 1930s, bearing in mind that Derek Walcott and his twin brother, Roderick, were born in 1930. The significance of the steel pan was not lost on these young men. Derek immortalized the pan in his play, Steel, in which he examined the origins of the instrument and its effect on the world in which it was forged. Roderick took it one step further and he focused on the violent rivalries and disturbances that were linked to the steel pan in his play, Shove Tuesday March. So we see then that our celebration here today is of importance. The evolution of the steel pan is more than an understanding of how young, uneducated, idle ghetto boys grappled with making music out of throwaway oil drums, but is a study in how the human spirit overcome racism, class, poverty, and disenfranchisement to beat the social structures imposed by politicians, the church, and the wealthy to gain worldwide acclaim and recognition as the creators of the only new musical instrument of the 20th century. Today, there are steel band associations throughout the world. We have them from Trinidad to Australia, St. Lucia to Germany, Russia to Botswana, Switzerland to Japan. Well, don't even ask about the USA. Let us celebrate the steel pan cause it is ours. At this time, we wish to make a presentation of awards. Of awards will be done by Mrs. or Honorable Janine Girodi McIntyre, Chairperson of the National Archives Authority of St. Lucia. Our first award goes to Mr. Ivan Smith. He is the son of Leonard Scrub Wellington. He has been working with the St. Joseph's Convent for the past 21 years, and he is always available to help people who are interested in learning PAN and getting involved with PAN. I don't see it. Our next award goes to Gregory Shining Emmanuel. Gregory was here during the week and he saw a photo that we have of 
our independence in association with Britain, 1967. And he pointed out to me that the pan men who were there was actually diamond steel. So he has been around for a long time. He doesn't look it, but he has. <laughs> Our next award goes to Arthur Jakes Jacobs. Many of you may not know it, but in 1957, when St. Lucia had its first solo pan competition, Jakes was the first individual to win this. And we are told that he beat Scrub and all the other men who were there, and they pay, played pan in lap. Oh, accepting on his behalf is Miss Barbara Jacob Small. Everybody knows Barbara. <laughs> and she is a pan player. She was a very active member of Allegro Pan. Our next award goes to Mr. Monty Maxwell. When we set up our music and entertainment archive, Monty was there with us. Monty is one of our friends. It's not because he's our friend we're giving him the award, you know. We're giving him the award because of all the work he has done for Viewfort and for the students whom he has been helping to become better pan players. <laughs> Our next award goes to the St. Lucia National Steel Bands Association. This association has been trying to encourage individuals encourage the bands to continue and to persevere so we have our our speaker to accept on behalf of the association yeah. we cannot leave our women out you um and we have an award that we wanted to present to, to Marilyn McDonald, one of the first women in PAN, but she couldn't make it. And we also have one for Antonia Sikra Gibson. You all know Gip, Gip, um, Sikra. He has been very, very influential on the PAN scene. So we are going to keep these two awards and we'll have our own private little ceremony for, the, for them to accept the awards. Madam Chairperson. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, for assisting us this morning. Let's call on the St. Mary's College Steel Orchestra to play for us. Let's welcome them, please.
at this time, I want to call on the chairperson of our Noble Laureates Festival Committee, Dame Paulette Louise, and she will do two things today. As usual, she will declare our Archives Month open under the theme Celebrating Excellence 2020 Vision, and afterwards, she's going to cut the ribbon so we could enjoy seeing what the archives was able to mount up for you. Uh, thank you, Margo. Uh, as has become customer, customary, the National Archives Month has always not just coincided, but you know, started with the Nobel Laureate Festival observances. And uh, every year when we first meet to decide on the um, activities, everybody awaits um, eagerly the suggestion that Margot is going to put forward. Mind you, she always keeps it as a closely guarded secret. I mean, you don't get the, the, you know, the real meat of the thing. She says, well, we're working on something. It will be nice. And, and um, you know, sometimes we kind of scratch our heads because, you know, you're never quite sure. But I have to admit that she seldom, oh, I should say she never disappoints. And this year, um, the, the steel band, that has been featured there. Now, if you notice, um, you know what she calls it, you know, the, the steel pan evolution, revolution, acceptance. And she has capitalized the, the letters that we, you know, can take away. Steel pan, the steel pan era, evolution, revolution, acceptance. Um, I don't know if it's quite by coincidence of after Margot announced what the um, exhibition is going to be all about, I happen to have been listening to um, Trinity TV um, on a Sunday morning, Channel 194. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was a discussion that was being, that was held with the, the Archbishop, Archbishop Jason Gordon. And he was talking about the steel pan and the, the history of the steel pan and the evolution of the steel pan. Now, it was more a kind of um, social treatise, if you want to put it that way. And just as we've heard today, he, ma he made the point that steel pan started among the disenfranchised, the, the, what we might probably now call the vulnerable sectors of society. And they were the ones, as um, Margot mentioned, who showed that, that um, resilience of the human spirit. Of course, they were looked up. No, I mean, as we know, still pan was not necessarily regarded as the kind of thing that you wanted to be associated with. But they persisted. And le look at where still pan is it today. In fact. Archbishop Gordon now laments the fact that now it has been taken up by the, by the elite. And it would appear that the people who started um, are now kind of don't even seem to be able to find a place in that you know, new and, and emerging movement. So I am glad, I mean, it, as I say, it was by, perhaps by coincidence, but I'm glad that it, that it was seen as a, a comment, a commentary on, on society and the way, you know, we, we forget the people who, who came, the people who were pioneers, the people who started things, and when it gets to flourish and bloom, we seem to to forget them, to relegate them to the rubbish heap of history, if you want to put it that way. So when you look at the, the anthem of the, the archives, um, it is true to say, after all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all we've left behind, 
May the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Now, that can apply to any aspect of life. But today, we are looking at um, the, the contribution that the sectors of society that we may think you know, are not quite you know, worthy of, of um, uh, emulation or whatever, do, in fact, make significant contributions to social and national development. And uh, just before I, I declare the exhibition open and the month open, I've, I've been listening to, I wouldn't call them criticisms, but comments of our, our Nobel laureate activities and the fact that it is heavily weighted on the arts. And, uh, and people ask, you know, where is Sir Arthur in all that? I just want to make the point that so many people think of Sir Arthur simply as an economist. But Sir Arthur was a social scientist. He was very much interested, and not only interested, committed to the development, to the social development of the vulnerable, the underprivileged, the disenfranchised. So, and he even, working out of the, of the UK, was very much involved in social development initiatives. So um, I'm sure Sir Arthur would have been very pleased to know that the, the steel pan, the beginnings, have now found themselves way up there with the violin, the viola, the, what they call the one on the road? Cello. <laughs> yeah, the cello is something. Oh, oh the one you stick on the ground and you. Yeah, oh, that's the cello. Yeah. There you are. <laughs> um, now, Margo, you know what the next um, uh, exhibition would need to be, you know. Or maybe we go beyond the exhibition and teach us a bit about, um, you know, uh, music starting with the steel band. So, having said this, again, it is with the greatest pleasure that I declare open. National Archives Month. I think um, from today till the 31st of March. So everybody has the opportunity throughout the month of February and March to come in and, and look at the exhibition and uh, understand the, the history, the development, the evolution, the revolution, and the acceptance of as we proudly a claim, the acceptance of the only musical instrument to have been, um, what was the verb? Created, created in, the in, in the 20th century. And it happened, if you will remember, it happened right here. So um, I declare open National Archives Month, and then I will go down there and declare open this uh, year's exhibition, the Steel Pan Era, the Steel Pan Evolution, Revolution, Acceptance. Thank you very much. I now formally declare open the um, 2020 exhibition of the National Archives Authority of St. Lucia, celebrating excellence, vision 2020.